We hear now armchair astronomy with members of the American Museum Hayden Planetarium staff talking to WBAI's David W. Teske. This is the 46th in our continuing series of programs on astronomy. Contributing their time and knowledge to this venture are members of the American Museum Hayden Planetarium staff. They come hoping to give us laymen a fuller understanding of our universe. On today's program, the topic of the discussion is Astronomy at Agnes Scott College. With us is astronomer Dr. Kenneth L. Franklin and Dr. William Calder, Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Agnes Scott College, Decatur, Georgia. Welcome both of you, and Dr. Franklin, will you begin? Thank you, Dave, and Bill, it's good to have you with us today on Armchair Astronomy. Now, a large number of people probably want to know what kind of uh, astronomy work is done in a relatively small college. First of all, tell us about Agnes Scott College. Well, Agnes Scott College is a small, and by that I mean about 750 students. It's a woman's college, and it's located essentially in Atlanta. It's Decatur in the suburb. And uh, it's a very nice college. I've been very happy there, and I went there when there wasn't any astronomy, but there's some prospect that something might be done. It was originally thought there'd be a cooperative venture with Emory and Georgia Tech, but it turned out that Agnes Scott carried the ball, and we've ended up with a very fine teaching observatory. It's probably unequal for a college that uses it ex exclusively for public and other education purposes. Well, I've visited you down there yes, at Agnes Scott very pleasant memory. a few years ago, and I certainly enjoyed it very much. It's a beautiful campus, and I might say the girls are rather pretty, Thank too. Thank you. I yes, think. I agree. There are many attractions down there. Uh, you also have a, a pretty nice instrument, as I recall, in the yes, observatory. Yes, we, we have a 30-inch uh, reflecting telescope, which uh, we acquired through odd circumstances, because it had to be given up by a man that used to have it as a toy in his backyard. And uh, we acquired it, although it it's, doesn't have good guiding clockwork. It's uh, irregular. It's an overloaded thing. It used to, used to be a 12-inch refractor. Now it's a 30-inch reflector, and it's fine for visual purposes, and that's, of course, what we use it for exclusively. I tried a prog program with a photoelectric cell for a time, but I was working day and night, and I, the results were not worth the effort. Don't you have a uh, photographic device on the side well, of the two? Well, I, I, I take so. a few pictures of planets and short exposure things. And well, do you use it mainly for teaching purposes? Yes, uh, and we have a, a great deal of public entertainment. We have open nights, and we're in the headquarters of the Atlanta Astronomers, and they're in a very active group. Well, Atlanta is a, uh, as I understand it, a, a quite an intellectually it's alert community. a very community. beautiful place to live. It has good music and all sorts of advantages of a good city. Now, you don't have any real uh, uh, astronomy majors, I don't believe, at Agnes Scott. No, we, we only offer a major in physics. My department is chiefly a physics department, really. But, of course, anybody that's interested in astronomy would do well to major in physics, as I did myself, and get a good background in physics and math. Yes, uh, that's a good background, uh, because after all, if you don't know physics, it's kind of hard to understand you what you're looking at. In astronomy. Right. astronomy is just king-size physics, really, mostly. <laughs> well, where did you do your work, Bill? Well, I graduated at the University of Wisconsin, and then I did my graduate work at Harvard. I took a master's in physics at Wisconsin before I left, and I was on the staff there at the Harvard Observatory for a number of years after I finished my degree. What did you do your work Well, in? I was working in photoelectric photometry, and I was measuring the brightnesses of stars in groups like the Pleiades in the hope that by redoing the groups year after year, we'd get a good basis so that later on, a century later, some poor guy might freeze to death and redo and see if there are secular changes that are appreciable and various things of that sort. And then I tried to measure the apparent brightness of the sun and the moon and a variety of things, Cepheid variables and eclipsing binaries. Well, you looked at practically everything you could look at. Yes, we did quite a lot of photog photometry. Did you do color work too? No, a little bit with two fillers, but it was a blue sensitive cell ex exclusively in those days. and didn't do much in color. 
Bill, you talk as, this, as if this were quite some time ago. Well, of course it was. There's been an awful lot of progress since then in sensitivity of cells and recorders, and things are much simpler, I would believe, to observe now than the way I used to time the rate of charge of an electrometer with a stopwatch time and time and again. And uh, when I look at my notebooks, which I still have, it really is amazing the precision of the recordings. I used a stopwatch that's supposed to go to a hundredth of a second. And on a good clear night, the air was amazingly small. And you took a group of 10. The scatter would be only about, never more than about five hundredths. Five hundredths of a second? Yeah. Well, how how did you go about thing. making the observation? Well, I watched a needle and that went along a scale, a fine little needle in the microscope, and I could get the rhythm of it, gauge the rhythm of it. And uh, there's quite a carryover. Later on during the war, I was working for the Harvard Optical Research Laboratory, and that was set up to uh, improve aerial photography. And the purpose was, of course, to get as good pictures at 40,000 feet as had been taken at 10,000. And we had a, a runway where we had resolution targets on the ground. And we'd fly over and take pictures of, in various conditions and studying vibration, all that sort of thing. But uh, we naturally tried to hit the target when it was right straight below. And uh, that watching that needle in the stopwatch <laughs> made it, uh, it was, Phenomenal how I could hit the center compared with the other observers that uh, hadn't had that experience of just timing something. It's curious training. Yes, it is. Well, of course, uh, astronomy is often thought as being unrelated. To, of course, it's not so much nowadays to human things, but the whole science of uh, psychology, that is experimental psychology, goes back to the problem of reaction time. Best of First time that it was suggested that the observer itself, his himself, was part of the equipment. Yeah, the uh, personal equation. Yeah, uh, that's right. Yet yeah, now we've been trying to get rid of the person involved yeah, in this thing all right. the time. Well, that's right. Well, now uh, you, you say you were looking at the charging up of the electrometer yes, and the needle. Right. Uh, did you? Uh, you have to time it uh, when it came to a certain value, yeah. and then you, go, and you recorded the time. Zero, and then the tenth division. Just watch the thing go, and the times are the order from, well, for the brightest stars that I use the most light, you know, say seven seconds up to 20 seconds, the periods, and I used to take a set of about 10 readings. What kind of a telescope did you use on Well, that? this is mostly on that, a fresh air, old 24-inch um, Harvard Observatory. Nowadays, it has a dome, and I used to be standing out there in the open, and it used to get mighty cold. I remember one night I didn't budge off that platform for three hours, and it was nine below zero and there's a terrible wind. And most of the time I had to fuss with things with bare hands. And the people that were doing photography <laughs> would be sitting in the warm office most of the time, then walk out and check their instruments, then go back in. They, they really didn't have any conception of what observing can be. <laughs> well, you're certainly a dedicated soul in those I was, days. But my dedication ran out for that sort of thing. <laughs> No, I can see what you mean by somebody else freezing in a hundred years. Right. I, I don't think they will. I tell you, hell had no terrors for me in those days. <laughs> <laughs> now, the uh, photoelectric equipment uh, consists today of a, usually a photomultiplier uh, followed by an amplifier with various uh, gain steps in it mm -hmm. and uh, a batch of filters that you can uh, put in the way when required and uh, Perhaps there will be even several different photo cells that you mm -hmm. can put in the light train. And then everything is recorded. And everything is recorded, and uh, uh, a technician can practically do the job. That's uh, right. It doesn't really require the astronomer except to set up the program in the first place. Now, that's today. Uh, what kind of electronic equipment did you have? Uh, what was the photo cell? Well, that was a handmade thing by the one man in the world that made the best ones, Jacob Kuntz at Kuntz. the University of Illinois. And there's a great demand for his tubes, and naturally Stebbins, the world authority, got the very best. And the problem was, of course, you had to add as much voltage as possible to get faint stars, and you're working almost at the point where it was going to flash. But if it did, that ruined the cell, and there was a catastrophe. There was an element of nerve in there that was most uh, 
wearing as, as much as the coal. <laughs> and then the recording technique was just watching this. Yes, the, reading the stopwatch. Reading the recording. stopwatch when the uh, meter got to a certain value. Yeah, that's right. Well, it has gone a long way since yep. those days. Well, let's get back to Agnes Scott College. It's a liberal arts college. It's a liberal arts college. Mm-hmm. And uh, you and uh, one other are the physics department That's right. there. Mm -hmm. And all the astronomy is taught in your department. That's right. We have two large sections of a basic course that runs a year, and then a few advanced courses. We often have students from Emory University and Georgia Tech that come over. And of course, we often have classes from other institutions at night, in addition, of course, to the open nights that we have. It's a great demand for a place to go and look at the stars. And do you ever get a chance to go home? Well, occasionally, yes, I, I do. <laughs> this is one of the problems that I find uh, actually uh, working in the planetarium. On yeah. occasion, my wife has taken courses from uh, from me just to come and see me. <laughs> uh, imagine this happens to you on occasion. That's right. Well, now, um, besides the physics that you have to teach, uh, in the astronomy, I know that uh, when I was visiting you there a few years ago, you had many teaching aids that were, uh, I thought, really quite ingenious. Um, the eclipsing binary machine, for instance. Yeah, that was a good little uh, thing. I still use it every year. It's a synthetic binary star, which uh, goes through the star eclipse, and I can vary the parameters, the diameters and the relative surface brightnesses. I have a little photoelectric cell that is on a telescope that views it the way a, a real observatory would get the message and then you can watch and take readings of microemitter and from the observations which uh, can be done in a few minutes you can compute the relative diameters and relative surface brightnesses and a few elementary things but they're very uh, revealing about the nature of stars. And then I've got an interesting little solar telescope that pipes in the light of the sun and projects it on a white wall so that uh, all during the clear days, so you can have this interesting image. Of course, you can't see prominences, but you can see sunspots. Uh, we decided that this year we'd have to flunk the sun and give it a D because there were so few spots. It's a bad <laughs> year. No bad performance. I remember that device. That's the one that you have mounted on, uh, on roller skates. Roller skates, skate, yeah. Right. I'll run it out the window, get the mirror. It runs by a telecom motor. Get it out in the sunlight, pipe it up through a telescope or to a telescope. You had something there that was down a long corridor, as I recall. Was this the moon projected on a sphere? Yeah, that always is of interest to people. Uh, projecting a photograph in an ordinary slide projector on a ground glass, a rough globe, and you get a beautiful 3D moon, and the people that see it at night gush over. The amateur astronomers, it looks so real. You captured moon. I could rent park benches and make a lot of money on weekend nights there up in the hall there. <laughs> Maybe you'll have to get a hold of some of these Mariner 4 pictures and put them on the globe, too. I think oh, that might be rather interesting. They too. sort of don't seem as romantic as the... Well, no. Not not in the God of War, I suppose. Uh, what other devices do you have there? Well, I've got a little homemade planetarium, which really uh, had a lot to do with the start of the project there. I made it with a pinhole projector with the globe, and then I added planets It could be adjusted it doesn't adjust automatically but in a small room it's uh, built for the purposes of only a 15 foot dome but it's uh, said to be quite effective even though it's a homemade thing and then I built a rough measuring machine for photographic work and we try to measure a few things like radial velocities and well actually I try to have a little sample of everything that is done in an observatory. I've got a little filer micrometer. We can put on a telescope and measure diameters of planets and separation of double stars. I've got a solar prominence spectroscope, which is hard to use, but it does give, if you know how to interpret it, and if you can hold it on the image well, it gives a nice image of a prominence. This is a, an H-alpha yeah, device that you look at the lens of the sun. and grading combined, and it's almost direct vision, but it has considerable dispersion. In fact, I'm trying now to make a um, filter. I have a, bought a, an interference filter. It's not the expensive Leo type, but 
one of the, I think it's probably 25 angstrom width or so, but I'm going to try to observe prominences that way, blocking off the sun as with the coronagraph. It's supposedly possible. You'll still have to give the sun a D now, though, because well, it's still not too Yeah, prominent. that's true, but it's perking up, and we expect it to show in a few years or very soon. Uh, the girls that take your astronomy courses, uh, do they start out and then take several of them, or...? Uh, Some do. Uh, not many go on, but, uh, well, they don't stop their activity when they even graduate. When they, uh, For instance, there's one girl that spikes the astronomy club at Macon, and uh, they've just blossomed out. They've got a nice little planetarium there, and uh, it, even though they may not be professional astronomers, they are still interested. I find that all over. Well, this makes a fascinating hobby, astronomy, I yes, think. Yes, it does. It surely does. That's why I went into it and why everybody else, I think, goes into the subject. What have you found the girls to be interested in over the years? Has it changed uh, from the first uh, astronomy teaching you've done there? What kind of questions No, I don't believe so. And enrollment hasn't shot up. People would think that uh, maybe now in the space age the enrollment would double, but... Uh, it's held more or less constant. I think people are now so used to all these exciting things that they don't make too much impression anymore. We see a new satellite and we hear about it and we're getting to the point that it doesn't make as much impression as it used to. Yeah, amongst the students, you say the students well, are rather blase? I think so, do. true. I think that's noticeable everywhere. The townspeople as well? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's bound to be. Well, I think it's true that we've noticed that here too. Yeah. But the, the real appeal of astronomy is uh, all the greater the more we learn. I think you have to have an, something of an education in astronomy before you uh, uh, can find where a large part of the appeal is, unless you just happen to have a, a, a knack for it, a yen for it somehow. Now you uh, have told me about your observatory there and the, uh, uh, the group that comes to visit in your open houses. Uh, what, what sort of uh, interest do we, these people We've got some interesting ones. Uh, I was just pointing out the cover of Sky and Telescope about a couple of months ago. I had a beautiful color painting of the eclipse last December. And that was one of our members who was a commercial artist. He came to the first astronomy club meeting. And then later on, I started a telescope making club and he was in that. And then later he built a 16 inch and he's, he's a whiz in astronomy. He entertains a lot of people, but he, he makes beautiful drawings. And uh, as you know, the range and in intensity is so great you can't get it very well with photography and the eclipse of the moon. He, he did a beautiful job. And then we've got others around there. One of our members, although he's not an astronomer, he's a, he actually works at the uh, biological, the government national health laboratory there, but he's one of the recorders of the uh, planetary group, the ALPO. Yes, Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. He's the recorder for Uranus and Neptune. And well, he's, he's got some rough planets to work with. Yeah, he has, and he's learned an awful lot. He's been around the observatory since he was a kid, and he used to see belts on the moons of Uranus, and oh. he's now getting to the point where he doesn't see things like that. <laughs> Is that good or bad, I wonder? Well, it's all part of the process of getting educated. It certainly it? is. Oh, well, we have a whole variety of types of people. Of course, that's typical everywhere. And what amazes me is that year after year, we have such a faithful group. And we have many advanced physicists from Georgia Tech, very well read, and they keep coming year after year. And of course, they contribute a great deal. Then we have other people that uh, know relatively little. But it's a satisfying thing that we've got such a loyal and uh, constant group. And of course, there are always more people adding. And we have all sorts of activities, picnics and star parties. We have large ones where we take small telescopes out to the parks. And of course, that's old stuff in many cities. Are there a large number of people who make their instruments oh, there? Oh, yes. I think now, though, there's not much point in making instruments. You can buy them so relatively cheap. Yeah. A lot of people just have the hobby of making the instruments, and then they wonder and what to do with it afterwards. Yeah. And then there's that sad bunch that make a mirror and haven't any way of mounting it. And that's a problem. 
But nowadays, you can get such an awfully good telescope for about $200. And yes, there are some pretty good ones now. Next, uh, in our planetarium, the uh, uh, local amateurs in the New York area have the opportunity of making telescopes. Mm -hmm. There is a uh, mirror-making class, and they come in and grind up their mirrors, at, uh, uh, six inch mirrors. It's uh, a course that's sometimes labeled 20 miles around a barrel in grinding these things, but then after they're done, they have a mirror. Now mm -hmm. what do you do with it? Do you have to put it into a telescope or it's useless? And then once you get a telescope, why, um, uh, as I say, a lot of people have wondered what in the world to do with them. Well, the saddest thing is the man that gets a nice telescope and then he finds that his backyard has so many trees he can't use it very well. That happens all the time. <laughs> it's almost as bad as building the boat in the basement. Yeah, you can't exactly get it out. Yeah, same situation. Well, what are observing conditions like down there? Well, they're yeah. not bad. Of course, the uh, city lights are getting worse every year, but our college, as you know, is almost in the woods in some ends of the campus, and the observatory is still pretty good. And considering it's accessible, girls can walk over and... Ten minutes, that's worth a great deal. Yes, it's good to have it close mm -hmm. by. We have to have it in order to use it effectively. Well, what's the uh, geometry of the colleges there, Agnes Scott, Emory, and George? Well, Tech. Emory is a rather large university, and it's recently gone co-ed. Georgia Tech is flourishing. It's growing by leaps and bounds. And, of course, the uh, University of Georgia is not very far away, and they recently had an observatory, and they, that's a growing department. What kind of equipment do they they've have? They've got a 24-inch uh, Casa Green, and uh, uh, they've got a little planetarium. These, uh, you said that Emory and Georgia Tech come over to use your Yes, they don't have any department of astronomy in either place at present. They, uh, uh, Georgia Tech has civil engineering courses, and... They're interested in basic astronomy and then mm -hmm. practical time. But maybe something will come at Georgia Tech because they've got a lot of a new space center that's just in the drawing board. A space center? Mm-hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. that sounds interesting. Yeah. They should have something there in the conventional astronomy, too. Bill, I... Um I'm going to ask you something personal here. I happen to know that you've got a good hobby at playing the harp. Where did oh, you get Oh, yes. That? I'm crazy about that. I would that'd be the last thing I'd give up. <laughs> <laughs> Fiddling and harping are two hobbies. I play harp in uh, the community orchestra in an Atlanta uh, group, and I used to play the viola in the Atlanta Symphony. Uh, those are extremely important as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> How many? Maybe the last thing I'd give up, as a matter of fact. How many harps do you have? Oh, just two. A uh, big one, and then a little Irish harp that I use for Roman banquets and corny <laughs> things of that sort. <laughs> when did you get interested in the harp, Bill? Well, I always uh, was fascinated by it. I used to play fiddle a great deal. I used to play in quartets, and then I thought I'd branch out to something else, and I thought I was going to get a string bass there ran onto a harp and I bought it and it's the best thing I ever did. <laughs> <laughs> when was this? That was the, uh, oh, it was a long time ago when I was at Harvard as a, uh, on the research staff there. You know, I know a lot of astronomers that play different instruments. Oh, yeah. Uh, I almost played with Albert Einstein one time. We were going to have a quartet arranged. He was going to play the first fiddle. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he had come and brought his fiddle several times. I'd heard him, but this time I was going to have the honor of playing second fiddle, but Mrs. Einstein got sick, so it didn't materialize. Oh, that was too a bad. Blow. That would be pretty good to play a second fiddle well, to Einstein, be, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, I missed the boat. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's see. Peter Vandekamp plays. Uh, yeah, he plays piano and also fiddle and viola. Mm -hmm. he's, very good he's down at Swarthmore. Yeah. And uh, he has a colleague down there... Uh, uh, Sarah Lippincott, who uh, plays a bassoon. Oh, is that so? Yes. Right. Hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, um, C.D. Shane, the uh, retired director of Lick mm -hmm. Observatory, plays the cello. And uh, one of his associates plays the violin, too, and they used mm -hmm. to get together and play things quite often. But, you know, I've never heard any of these. I've heard uh, Peter Vandekamp play the piano, and he does a nice job with this. But it sure would be interesting sometime at some of these... Uh, astronomy meetings to uh, 
She yeah, uh, she couldn't get together a little quartet or... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think everybody tried to be the leader, though. <laughs> Oh, no, I don't think... <laughs> I know also that you're a pretty good photographer. Well, I wouldn't say that. I, I, for myself, I make a lot of stereo pictures. I'm a fan of stereo pictures, and I make lots of slides, And but I'm not... I wouldn't consider myself much of a photographer. I used to teach a course in photography. I've done quite a bit in it. I recall a, uh, one of these World War, uh, well, let's see, I guess it was an artillery rangefinder that you'd take some stereo pictures through. Say, you've got a terrific memory. I am <laughs> amazed at how much you can remember. <laughs> yes, I did that. I made a stereoscope with two periscopes mounted on a big board, so I had a separation of about, uh, I think, 10 feet or so. And I used to carry that thing up Stone Mountain, and you'd get the most amazing effect when you looked at rather distant church steeples and things like that. I wish I'd had that device this summer when I was out at the Grand Canyon, because yeah. then uh, I saw a, a photograph that a fellow took of the Grand Canyon with a stereo camera. He covered up one lens and took a photograph, and then he walked about a quarter of a mile in another direction and uh, zeroed it in on the same distance thing, and he took another, the other lens worth then. Gosh. And what a picture that was. You could really see depth almost clear to the other side. And of course, that's a good 10 miles. Yeah. Um, he projected these in his backyard, and we had Polaroid glasses to uh -huh. look with, and a uh, metallic reflecting screen. Uh -huh. And it, it, uh, it was really quite an effect. Everybody went really ooh and ah yeah, over that when he put that on. Be something. And he was very lucky with the uh, registration because it... Uh, yeah, that would be very critical. I'm surprised he could manage it. So he sent it just to uh, the ordinary... Um, um, of course, he wouldn't need a stereo camera. Just use one camera and move it to two places. <clears throat> well, he had the whole, the whole stereo bit, but uh, he, that, was, that was really spectacular. Uh -huh. what, do you, uh, what do you plan for uh, Agnes Scott as a physics department, as an astronomy department? You, uh, well, we're adding an awful lot of physics equipment. We've, a we've uh, added a huge amount in the field of atomic physics in the last few years. And uh, we're hoping to add some more things in astronomy. In fact, I'm hoping to get a another telescope for photographic purposes. We need it terribly. Mm -hmm. And I'm working on this solar telescope I mentioned for prominences. You're going to um, expand your offerings at all? Uh, oh, as much as possible, surely. How about expanding the school? There are some schools I know that always want to stay. Uh, Our stay school under genuinely wants to stay rather small. We're adding an enormous number of buildings. Got a brand new art building. It's a beautiful thing. The next thing is another gymnasium. But uh, nobody wants to make it over a thousand. I don't know whether that's good or bad, but I'm very happy there. I like the setup. You reckon? You recommend um, a small well, for, for undergraduate purposes. Of course, if anybody were really interested in the very best in advanced physics, it would certainly be a good thing to go to university. I say that openly. I say that to my students. Anybody is seriously wanting physics more than anything else, it would be better to go to a place where each man is a specialist and can certainly have more equipment. That's what I did when I was an undergraduate. Well, in a liberal arts college, of course, uh, I don't think you would ever get a uh, uh, somebody trying to become a, a specialist in uh, in physics. No, for the most part, in general education, 99% of our students are married in about two or three years. And that's as it should be. Yes, and they undoubtedly make very good wives yes, to some mm -hmm. specialist-type husbands, perhaps. <laughs> Well, Bill, it's been a great pleasure to have you with us here today. And uh, well, thanks, I enjoyed it very much, Ken. Good, and uh, I hope to come see, down you. see us down there. Oh, again, I'd be delighted. So that was a glorious trip I had, and I'd like to do it again sometime. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you both very much. We have been listening to astronomer Dr. Kenneth L. Franklin and Dr. William Calder, the professor of physics and astronomy at Agnes Scott College, Decatur, Georgia. We hope you will be with us next week when Dr. Franklin will return with Mr. James S. Pickering to discuss the southern sky. 
We hope you will join us, and if you have any questions or topics about astronomy that you'd like explained or talked about, indicate them by card or letter to Armchair Astronomy, WBAI, 30 East 39th Street, New York, 16, New York. We will try to answer as many questions as possible in future programs. Until next week, good day. This has been Armchair Astronomy with members of the American Museum Hayden Planetarium staff talking to WBAI's David W. Teskey.